your unique story, our global audience, Global One Media. Hello, and a warm welcome to our series of interviews with senior leaders of companies across the board, where we help you, our viewers, make informed and intelligent investment decisions. I am Munir Barazi, your business analyst and host, and today I am pleased to welcome Ian L. Patterson, the CEO of Plurilock, a tech company that offers sophisticated machine learning technology that helps authenticate users and protect against identity theft. Plurilock is listed on the Canadian Venture Exchange as PLUR. Hello, Ian. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello. It's very good to be here. So, Ian, this is the first time we speak. Can you please introduce Plurilock for our viewers and tell us a bit more about what you do, your unique, your unique advantage, and how it all started? Uh, very happy to do so. Plurilock is a cybersecurity consolidator with unique artificial intelligence software that allows us to identify people based on their behavior within a matter of seconds. Um, we've been public for about two years. Uh, we, we listed in, in uh, 2020, uh, right, right in the middle of the pandemic. And the, the thing that makes us different is that we have uh, a, a unique uh, AI software that we sell to businesses, enterprises, and government agencies uh, which protects against uh, account takeover or account theft. Now that that could be uh, f physically, uh, somebody physically takes over your device. It could be that somebody hacks in remotely to a device, or it could be uh, somebody, uh, a bad actor that steals your login and password and tries to impersonate you. Our our software is designed to defend against that. Uh, and it does so by, by using a, a technology called behavioral biometrics. Uh, which allows us to identify who you are based on how you type on a keyboard, how you move a mouse. We build a profile or a signature, a digital signature of what's normal for you as an individual. It usually takes a couple of days to build that signature. And then once that signature is built, we're able to continuously authenticate every five to 10 seconds throughout the workday. So it provides a, a, a layer of protection, a defense in depth, uh, in addition to a traditional login and password or a, or a text message that you might get to your phone. So that's the, the technology at, at a business level. The, the reason that we are public is that we are growing through acquisition. We've made four acquisitions over the last two years, uh, and we've grown our revenue uh, from, uh, from uh, a, a, right around half a million dollars in 2020. Uh, and just this, this past year, two years later, uh, we've announced uh, year-to-date nine months revenues of $46 million, so almost 100x growth over, over two years. I think the reason for this uh, explosive growth is the fact that cybersecurity is so important and continues to grow in importance. And I'm I'm delighted to, to be here to talk to you more about that today. That's really remarkable, a remarkable jump in, in revenue within such a short period of time. Uh, but let me first go back uh, a bit and, and discuss your, your AI technology, uh, which you mentioned. Uh, can you uh, tell us a bit more about the platform, your value, your value proposition, and um, how do you leverage machine learning to provide the highest levels of protection to your customers? Well, it's a good question. So the, the, the central premise to, to what we are doing is that we saw that traditional cybersecurity protection for identities was insufficient. And the way that we uh, judged that was we saw that data breaches are happening continuously, it seems. It seems like every day we read something in the newspaper or, or online where data breaches are occurring. And there are technologies out there today that are designed to help prevent data breaches from occurring. So uh, think of a traditional login and password. Uh, it's been a, you know, a login and password has been around since the 1960s. It hasn't really changed much. Uh, the, the new improvement there is adding an additional factor of authentication. So that could be getting a, a text message to your phone. It could be typing in a six digit code. These are all small incremental improvements over that, that authentication moment or or what functionally you are doing to prove your identity to a computer is is what we call an authentication moment 
the, the, the central problem with all of these uh, approaches is that you're still only measuring a single point in time. Most people will, when they first log in to their work computer, they, they authenticate. Maybe that's nine o'clock in the morning. But the question becomes, are you still the right person at 10 o'clock in the morning, at 1 p.m. in the afternoon, at 6 p.m. in the afternoon. What we saw with, with COVID and the work from home movement is that many employees actually stayed to log in over multiple days. So they might log in at Monday morning at 9 o'clock. They would stay logged in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They might only actually authenticate once a week. Now, this is this is problematic from a security perspective because you're you're making an assumption that it's still the right person on that device, that it's not somebody else physically who has sat down or somebody who is remotely hacked in and taken over your device. So our, our thinking on this is that we needed to change the paradigm of authentication from just a single point in time to more of a continuous model. So that, that's really the premise. Now, the way that we're doing that is that we're using machine learning and AI to observe behavior, specifically the speed, rhythm, and cadence of how you type on the keyboard and the way that you move your mouse, the clicks, double clicks, scroll, the relationship between your keyboard and your mouse movements. Um, these are, there, there are unique characteristics or traits, behavioral traits that our machine learning models are able to first identify, then build what, what a normal pattern looks like. And then once that, that normal pattern or that signature is built for you as a person, again, usually takes a couple of days, then we're able to continuously com compare uh, your, your behavior against that model. I'll give you an analogy um, that I like to use. Most people um, think about your physical security in your house or your apartment. Most people will have a front door. And most people will have a good deadbolt lock on that front door provides pretty good protection, right? Um, but the question is, what happens if, if, if a bad guy is able to break a window, go around the door, circumvent the front door, and then enter your house? So in that analogy, Plurilock software is like having a motion sensor inside your house that can tell the difference between the fam your family and a bad actor, a bad guy who has gotten into the house based purely on their movement. Now, when we detect something anomalous or something bad, we're able to take action. Uh, the, the actions that we take when we detect something bad, we can alert, alarm, notify, or lock, or some combination thereof. So it's configurable, um, but, those, but there are multiple actions that we can take should we detect something anomalous. All of this, uh, this technology um, really wasn't possible 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, and it's really the result of, of the AI capabilities getting to where they are today uh, that we're able to do this not only uh, in real time, but also at scale. Uh, so our customers, uh, they have employees in the hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands of employees in size, which is a lot of data to process. And it's a lot of data to process in real time. Uh, but we're able to do that now as, as a result of where the technology is. So you're, you're relying on signatures that cannot really be forged or that are nearly impossible to forge in a way. I, I, yeah, it's a type of biometric. So it's so it's called behavioral biometrics. Uh, so most people are familiar with a thumbprint or a, uh, a handprint or a facial recognition scan. Obviously, the, the smartphones have been using traditional biometrics uh, for many years now, and, and we use this as part of our defense in depth security strategy. The key difference, though, is that whereas a traditional biometric, um, like a thumbprint or a facial recognition scan, is one and done, meaning you 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 scan the face and it either lets you in or it doesn't let you in. What we're doing is we're measuring continuously. So it's it's a field of study called behavioral biometrics. Now, uh, and our team, uh, our world experts um, on the data science uh, team, they're world experts in the field of behavioral biometrics. Uh, and so the technology itself um, uh, has gone through uh, extensive peer review. Uh, our, our core uh, team actually has published in over 100 uh, academic journal articles. Th those have received thousands of journal citations. Over 35,000 hours of research, in fact, has gone into this core technology, and we have six patents on it. So it's a, it's a difficult problem, but it's one that we believe is is critical to uh, to solving the current 
uh, uh, set of, of cybersecurity challenges that exist in the industry today. Which, which brings me to my next point. You are already one step ahead uh, of the attackers and you managed to find existing loopholes and close them in a way. But as you know, the cybersecurity landscape is evolving fast and impersonators and attackers keep developing their ways. How do you ensure that you remain ahead of the curve? It's a very good question. And I think that's one of the the key differences in cybersecurity as compared to other industries, which is that you are competing against an adversary uh, who is also trying to innovate. So we are innovating, our adversaries are innovating. And what that means is that we constantly have to uh, continue to try and stay one step ahead of the bad guys. Now, this is different compared to uh, compared to a, a resources company, for instance, your adversary is the mountain that you need to mine. You know, the mountain is not actively working against you, although, you know, weather might, but they're not actively working against you to try and disrupt your business. Well, in our industry, they are. Now, what that means, though, is that um, it, there is a constant need for further reinvestment, not only from our company, but also our customers' company. And so what we see is a tremendous need for our customers, again, who are larger enterprise and, and government agencies, to constantly invest in cybersecurity. Us as a service provider, uh, whether we're selling software or whether we're selling services or whatever it is that we're doing, what that means is that there is a, a strong uh, tailwind, a, a strong uh, need for our customers to continue spending money uh, to defend against threats. So that's that's one just massive driver for purchasing uh, in the industry. The second, though, is that there's a, a growing awareness, which is filtering into the regulatory landscape about the importance of cybersecurity. So there are a, a growing number of regulations um, both from uh, from governments, but also from industry uh, associations and even insurance companies that are requiring stronger cyber defenses to be purchased and deployed in order for a business just to operate. So uh, in Europe, obviously, we've had GDPR, uh, which which requires um, that companies safeguard data. In North America, there are equivalent or similar um, uh, sets of, of legislation coming online. The California Data Protection Act, for instance. Um, we're also seeing from an industry pr perspective, um, it, uh, industries like the financial services industry has, has PCI DSS. Um, and so there are requirements in these things that say you as a business, if you're operating in this industry, whether it's financial services, healthcare, pharmaceutical, manufacturing, critical infrastructure, education, that there are requirements to safeguard data and systems, which then are drivers, again, for purchase behavior of, of products and, and services. Um, so I think that that's that. Those are just some of the the dynamics uh, that uh, that are um, present in our industry, which might be a little bit different from from other industries. All right, and and you already mentioned earlier that revenue is increasing, so I can assume safely that it, demand is increasing as well. Um, can you tell me a bit about how you see the demand evolving in the future and? Also, a bit more about your customers and who they are, uh, mainly. So, I, I think that those those two key drivers we just talked about the 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 threats from bad actors and the regulatory pressure. Both of those together are leading to an industry that's estimated to total over one trillion dollars of of purchasing over the next five years uh, cumulatively. So there are massive tailwinds when it comes to the opportunity of cybersecurity. Now, now, I think the other thing that it's important to note in cybersecurity is that it's very fragmented. And this is part of the reason why we at Pluralock have taken a growth through acquisition strategy, is that we see that there is a, an opportunity to better serve our customers by consolidating um, uh, capabilities and then being a, a effectively a one-stop shop of those capabilities serving to our customers. So that's that's been a key part of our business strategy. Uh, as I mentioned, we've we've completed four acquisitions over the last two years. Three of those acquisitions actually came last year. Um, and in terms of who our customers are, we are focused on protecting uh, enterprises and government agencies. We have over 600 customers today. Uh, this includes very uh, notable uh, and very discerning customers, including the U.S. Army, U.S. Navy, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, as well as Canadian Defense, uh, Canadian Law Enforcement, or RCMP, 
um, and then a multitude of commercial clients, uh, a, a large focus in the financial services sector, as well as healthcare, uh, pharmaceuticals, manufacturing. Um, and so it's a, it's a pretty diversified set of customers who turn to us for their IT and cybersecurity needs. Uh, and that we're able to to deliver those solutions to them. All right, and and to talk a bit about uh, the acquisitions, can you tell me a bit about the synergies um, achieved uh, from those acquisitions? So it's it's a good question. There are, uh, as I, as I was saying, there are a very fragmented landscape when it comes to cybersecurity. And part of the value that we're able to deliver to our customers is that we can help them with that complexity and with that fragmented market. Um, and so that's part of the the goal here for us when it comes to to acquisitions. Um, Plurlock today, now having completed four um, acquisitions, we have a very strong platform that we're we're able to then uh, leverage for future acquisitions. And so by, by that platform, what I mean is um, we have a, a team over over seventy five people uh, in in a number of regional markets in North America. We also have two offices in India. Um, and so what that allows us to do is, uh, we have a very strong back office. Um, and so when it comes to finance, accounting, procurement, HR, legal, um, for smaller companies who maybe don't have those core competencies built out, um, when we go and, and acquire them, they're able to, to leverage that. Um, you know, similarly, uh, because we now have a lot more, uh, we have a lot more revenue going through our platform, we're able to uh, to bundle that uh, pricing power effectively, uh, you know, get better discounts from our, our vendors and suppliers. Um, and so as we continue to grow that platform, uh, I certainly would expect additional synergies to to come of that. Um, and so that's that's um, uh, you know that's a strat that's a tried and true strategy that that applies to a, to a number of industries. But I think particularly cyber, just because of its fragmented nature, um, is is really applicable and ultimately is driven by the customer, right? That's that's ultimately why we're why we're doing this and and why we believe that we will be successful. That sounds very promising indeed. And Ian, uh, my last question, are there any promising projects or updates you're working on right now that could be of interest uh, to investors and customers? What we have said in 2023 is that we're very focused on integration. Uh, so the existing companies that we acquired, we actually closed on two of those acquisitions in at the end of Q3 last year. So these are still recent. Uh, and so the company is very much focused internally on realizing those synergies uh, improving productivity, getting systems consolidated, uh, that sort of thing. So, so there's a, a huge focus on that right now. The second focus, though, is cross-selling. So one of the keys with us is being able to take a, a customer from one acquisition or one team and then cross-selling higher margin products to that customer. In other words, making uh, a unique capabilities, uh, particularly our AI capabilities, making those available to those customers, realizing uh, increased margins, and also just increasing the, the wallet share from those customers. So focus on integration, focus on margins and cross-selling. But then the last one, uh, the last key, key pillar for us in 2023 is opportunistic, um, which is very much that we believe that right now, um, uh, as as all valuations have have been depressed you know, relative to a year or two years ago, we believe that there's likely going to be some uh, some opportunities which uh, which we want to be positioned to take advantage of. Um, and so that's also a, a key pillar uh, for us. So continue to run the business, integrate, cross sell, look for opportunities. That's really the name of the game for us this year. It's a great outlook and lots of opportunities uh, on the way. Ian, CEO of Plural Lock, thank you so much for sharing all of those insights and information. We look forward to hearing from you again in the future. Thank you very much. I look forward to being back.